Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Ice Cream for PRs podcast. My name is Jeff Nippard, and joining me this week, I have a very special guest. His name is uh, Josh Vogel. Welcome to the show, Josh. Pleasure to be on here, Jeff. For sure, man. Um, yeah, we've been uh, wanting to, to collab now for, for a while, uh, so I'm glad that we finally got the opportunity to do it. Um, so why don't you go ahead and, and give our listeners a little uh, brief introduction. Um, how about you tell us a little bit about uh, your training background when you got kind of started into weightlifting. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Well, as Jeff said, my name's Josh Vogel. I am a NPC bodybuilder. I also have done a powerlifting meet, and I am doing another one up in, coming up in February. But pretty much all my training throughout my career so far, I've been doing this for five years now, I want to say. Yeah, five years. Um, it's all been bodybuilding based, and I've worked with a few different people. But yeah, I mean, that's pretty much. I'm a bodybuilder. <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, Josh is a very humble guy. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with him, I'd recommend going and checking out some of his uh, photos on Instagram. He's uh, he's a beast. Um, how old are you, Josh? I'm 20. 20, right? So you're like a yeah, you're like you're crazy young as as far as bodybuilding goes. And so uh, yeah, I think that you're a guy who uh, people need to kind of look out for um, in the future. Uh, so, so what is your what is your contest weight and your off-season weight? Okay. Well, when I first started working out or anything, I'll give all this information to. I was 103 pounds. I couldn't do a pull-up, and I currently I'm in my off-season. Um, I'm about 200 pounds right now. And this past year when I dieted down, I was 175 at stage. Yeah, so I compete at 175. Um, and how tall are you? I, I think you're like, we're about the same height, I think. Uh, should I give my E stats or my real <laughs> stats? <laughs> let's, let's, get, let's hear the real ones. Yeah, yeah. Five, I'm 5'6". Five, okay, okay. Yeah, so you're a little bit taller than me. I'm 5'4 and a half. Okay. So... Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, you're so short. Yeah, crazy, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, I was shocked when I saw, uh, what's his name, Jose Raymond. Uh, he did a, a guest posing at um, a local contest in Newfoundland, and uh, he, he was significantly shorter than me. Like, I, I would say he's no more than 5'2", maybe 5'3". Yeah, he's it, not a big guy, yeah. like height-wise. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. Um, so let's talk about your powerlifting then. What, what, what sort of lifts are you looking at? Um, what I, what I'm planning on hitting, um, I'm doing squats and wraps, so I want to hit about a 630 to 640 squat. I want to pull anywhere between 650 to 700 in bench four. Wow, those are some really big numbers. Yeah. And so that's, that's like raw plus wraps? Is that yes. It? Okay. It, yeah. It's called like classic raw, so it's, everything's raw, just squats, I use wraps. Right. And what, what was it you were hoping for? 600 to 6? For what? For your squat? Uh, I want to hit about 630 to 640. Wow, that's, that's huge, man. That's impressive. Thank you. And this is just your second meet, hey? Uh, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Um, so yeah, let's, let's dive into your uh, training approach. Okay. Um, so I guess you would be an another example of someone who balances both bodybuilding and powerlifting. So hopefully we can get into the nitty gritty of that. Uh, so Josh, how would you describe your your basic approach to training in terms of you know frequency, exercise variation, and periodization? Uh, or okay. Um, when I'm not training for a meet, I do pretty much every body part twice a week. I do a little bit higher frequency, but I still will focus more so on my weak points, which in my case is my shoulders and arms. So most like push pull legs programs you're going to go through it and you might hit two or three exercises per body part I'm still going to go in and hit about four or five exercises on those weak points and still really try to bring them up as I'm prioritizing those at the time but right now um, since I'm focusing more on a meat and doing a meat prep um, my volume is up to um, everything three times a week for my big three three times a week and doing still accessory but nowhere near like I was doing I'm only doing about three exercises for my um, uh, other body parts right um, 
So are, are you doing your own programming, or do you have a... Um, no. Um, for my nutrition, I work with Matt Jansen still. But for my programming for my NEAT, I am working with Adam Miller, who is one of the MI40 coaches. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so you you train at the same gym as, as Ben Pakulski, as I understand it. Is that right? Correct. It's actually his gym. Right. Yeah. So you've, I guess, had the pleasure of training with him and around him and, and all that kind of stuff. Maybe mm -hmm. you can tell us a little bit about what you've learned from Ben and what it's like to, to train with a guy uh, of his caliber. I will say I am very blessed to be a part of, like, his whole, like, gym and everything. Like, it's just an awesome opportunity. Like, if I stop and think about it, like, I'm training at a private gym around some of the top people in the world, and they're willing to help me in whatever I need. And it's just an awesome opportunity. Very thankful for that. But, yeah, I'm always learning new stuff. I mean, I don't always see eye to eye with everything they they do but I mean you're never gonna see eye to eye with everybody but like some of the things that Ben has taught me that has made like the biggest impact is more so especially when it comes to more bodybuilding style training is kind of slow down your lift some and really focus on the muscle working have that mind muscle connection and I believe that has made a big difference and as he says like he's like you know big weights will get you big muscles but he's like, if you were to reduce it slightly and really focus on what you want to be working, he's like, I, he says that's what he believes separates the good from the great. Mm. And I do agree with him on that aspect. Right. Um, so do you, do you ever find that that uh, impedes you as a, as a power lifter? Because I was reading a, an article that's soon going to be published by Greg Knuckles, and it's about sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So the idea that the actual muscle fibers aren't growing, but it's the kind of stuff inside of them uh, or, or around them, so like the glycogen and, and the, you know, the sarcoplasm, basically, um, mm -hmm. that, that's growing. And so that allows for you know, a lot of non-functional strength that you see in bodybuilders. So they've got all this muscle, but it's, not, it's just kind of like water and glycogen. You know, it's not actually like functional, useful muscle. Um, and so what you see is a lot of bodybuilders end up making weights that should look really easy to them look really hard <laughs> you know what i mean like i i remember seeing this video of, of brandon curry i don't know if he's a bodybuilder you're familiar with or not but he was deadlifting something like 185 or no it was 195 pounds for like seven or eight reps just ridiculous in a sumo deadlift and he was just cringing with the weight and it's like how can a guy of his size struggle with with such little load but I think it has to do with what you said. Like they're just so focused on feeling the concentric and eccentric contractions that they're not so much focused on moving the weight with max force. It's just actually feeling the, the muscles work that they want to be working. Right, and I don't agree with that extreme form of it. Right. I mean, obviously at that point, I believe that's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, heavy weight definitely has its place. And in my training, um, even when I'm more bodybuilding focused, I will still train relatively heavy with exercises. They're just, my goal isn't to move it from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. So I will have a little bit slower centric, maybe pause, you know, try to initiate a contraction more so before I begin. Things like that. So I've heard that Ben has engineered some of his own training equipment. Can you tell um, us a little bit about that? I don't think... I don't think he's, in, well, yeah, he actually he has the Pakulski bench, which is what Watson made for him, which is a bench with a very small back for, like, if you're doing dumbbell flies, you get a greater scapular retraction. Right. And it's actually, after using one, it's like you really don't want to do flies on anything else ever. It's, like, just such a better feel. Yeah, that, that actually sounds cool. I'm just trying to think of how I might be able to rig that up. Like maybe um, you can like actually do it. Yep, bench. if you use a foam roller. Or, like, if you do, like, seated cable flies, you can put the foam roller there on the bench, and it will allow you a very similar oh, type of movement. That's, a, that's actually a cool tip. So, I guess the, the scapular retraction just allows for a, a little extra range of motion, and then, like, you get a better feel. Correct. Very cool. Yeah. So, that's, like, one of the ones that um, he's helped engineer. But, like, the big thing, he's actually, I believe they just sponsored him. It's called Prime Equipment, which it was formerly Strive. But uh, Strive went out of business, so Prime got all the patents for it. But the machines, they have three parts to where you can load the weight. 
and you can actually load it through different ranges of the motion. So, the example, uh, incline chest press. Instead of just a hammer string for it, it's going to be all the way on one of the loading bars. There's going to be three spots on each side. So you can light or make it heaviest at the beginning, the middle, or end of the range of motion. Like for me right now, um, I'm using the, the incline prime machine, and I'm loading it more so at the beginning because on my bench press, the hardest part for me is actually getting it off my chest. My lockout's very strong. So I'm loading it mostly at the beginning, so I can really just focus more getting power out at that point. Right. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. It would be cool to see uh, some maybe EMG uh, studies done um, using that equipment to see <coughs> how well it actually does isolate different aspects of the muscle belly. Um, but I have no doubt that I, I'm not skeptical that it works. It would just be really cool to see, um, you know, how. How that's happening. Right. My favorite one is actually, um, it's a back row, but we took the normal back pad off and actually put like um, an elevated bench in there so you can do like the steel rows with it. Oh. And you can load it at the different angle or the different ranges of motion there while doing the steel row. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Like I would just love to have access to that kind of equipment just, just to be able to play around with it <laughs> if nothing mm -hmm. else. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's go back to the to the bodybuilding and powerlifting thing. So, um, so you're you're planning on competing in powerlifting. Is that something that you would do uh, preferentially in your off season, or do you think that you would do that leading into a contest? And how does your your training change from off season to contest? Okay, um, powerlifting. I don't think I would do pre contest um, as. I have to diet on generally a little bit lower calories than a lot of people, and I strength does go down significantly when I diet. Um, it's very hard for me to keep my strength at where where I would like it to be. So if I did a meet training for a show, like it would just be kind of pitiful. <laughs> um, my list my list would be pitiful, and I just I just wouldn't do that. But um, training off season wise. Um, is a li like when I dieted, I did I did more of like a bro split, very similar to like some of the video stuff you have been posting about, like how bro splits do work, and I actually very like that. Um, like I was only hitting my chest and legs once a week, but like my shoulders and arms, I was hitting more frequently as I was really trying to bring those up. But like in my off season, I do a more push pull legs type split when I'm not prepping or when I'm not prepping for a meet. Yeah, I actually think that that's interesting because, well, obviously, like, you have just a ridiculous set of wheels, um, and I would imagine with that... I actually didn't squat this last contest prep. Oh. I didn't squat from May till September. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that doesn't shock me or anything. I think a lot of people, for whatever reason, think that squats are a, a mandatory exercise, but there really are no mandatory uh, movements. No. So, um, is there any reason why you didn't squat or? Um, one, they're just very taxing, yeah. very taxing for me. So if I go in and do, you know, a pretty str pretty heavy squat session, um, you know, while on low calories and doing more cardio things like that, my CNS was just fried. I mean, I felt like crap all the time, and it just wasn't being beneficial for the overall progress I was trying to make. So we can still get the same gains without having to kill myself on squats while I do squats. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm curious to hear what it is you replaced them with. Um, hack squats and leg press, like like just more accessory stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I do. I have a love hate with hack squats. Some days I like them, some days I don't. I really don't know how I feel about them. <laughs> yeah, I like them. They're they're not something I use a lot, but. And it depends on the hack squat machine too, because some of them are just horrible feeling. Mm. Yeah, my the gym that I currently train at doesn't even have one, so if I wanted to do more of a quad dominant squat, I would probably just do a front squat. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can see that in prep where... Well, would you say that um, front squat would be superior for quad development than a high bar squat? You would say or wouldn't say? Or would you say that? I'm asking you. Um... Like why wouldn't you just do a high bar squat? I, I would I would say that the front squat probably involves more quads than than the high bar squat, but I would say that the actual differences might be insignificant if you tried to measure it 
Gotcha. Yeah, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, like I said, I, I would do hack squats more often if I had access to the machine regularly. Um, so with the squats, I, I actually had to leave them out for my prep for the Mayhem last year um, because I had a back injury, and I just replaced them with leg press and barbell hip thrusts. Uh, and, and I found that those were a, a good enough combo to you know hit the quads and the glutes, and then for hamstrings I would do you know it's a, a dumbbell Romanian deadlifts and either seated leg curls or lying leg curls, uh, Swiss ball leg curls, and then okay. that was essentially how I structured my leg training. Okay. Yeah, I, I just I, I want to go back to what you said about um, hitting your quads, and I think maybe it was your chest or, uh, once per week. Yeah, um, yeah, I was only doing those once per week because they were their stronger body part of mine. Mm. So I rather use the other days to really focus on what needed to be brought up or worked on more. Right, and yeah, I think that's a really important point, and it, and it ties in nicely with the idea of specificity for bodybuilding, mm -hmm. um, wherein just because you're a bodybuilder doesn't mean that push pull legs is is the best split for you. Right. Uh, you can be highly highly specific and say well, you know, my legs are a strong point, maybe I don't need to hit them uh, as frequently if, if they're already very highly, developed, very highly developed, I should dedicate more of my training volume to points that aren't quite as developed. Or you could say, well, you know, I have a really good back, it grows for me quite easily, genetically I'm predisposed to a lot of muscle there. Um, you might want to hit it more and make it even more of a strong point, but that still doesn't violate the specificity principle. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that there's no set frequency that you need to train at if you're a bodybuilder. It's all about building the best physique that you can. Correct. Yeah. And then at the end of prep, which was actually different than my, my training changed completely, I was actually doing two-a-day routines in which I was hitting everything multiple, multiple times per week that way. So I was doing two-a-days every single day for like I think the last three or four weeks of prep. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So how how do you how did you structure your training split when you did two a day? I, I actually played around with this for a little bit in, at the end of my last off season, and I did like it. Uh, what I would do is I would say, do a back workout or, or something like that in the in the morning, and then come in and finish off with biceps in mm -hmm. the in the evening, so that rather than just tack on, because this is something I've always struggled with with the push pull leg split, is that arms just seem to get tacked on at the end and so they don't get enough priority um, so so splitting up splitting up that workout into to a two a day um, was a good strategy for me so how did you manage that if I can remember right um, I would go in and I would do like chest in the a.m. session and go back and I believe it was quads in the p.m. the following day would be back and then shoulders and then I would do hamstrings and then arms at night, and then repeat. Hmm. So it was my workouts actually, everything was it was more hit style. So it was really work up to one working set per each exercise, and just make that set all out everything you've got. Hmm. So the volume was a little bit lower, but the intensity and frequency was up. That's interesting. I I haven't played around with a split that even resembled that remotely, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, did you find that you were able to adequately push yourself in the evening sessions? Did you find like when you did chest in the morning, your, your quad session would suffer a little bit? Actually, no. I mean, you know, I was tired because I was dying pretty hard. But my workouts, like every time I went in the gym, I, you know, it was a very good session each time. But And then you would take a full rest day and repeat the cycle? Um, actually, no. Usually just a day of cardio and then go back. Right. Yeah. But at one point, we weren't even taking an off day. We were just going straight through at that point. Mm -hmm. But it actually decreased the amount of cardio I was doing when we started doing that as well. So how long would each of those sessions be? Anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes. Okay. So that, that's why it was so manageable because I'm picturing yeah. like a Ronnie Coleman style chest workout. No. Followed by, you know, a quad workout. No, I'd probably do like four exercises. And like I said, like you do moderate, like three moderate work, like three moderate sets as quote unquote warm ups, and then one set all out of like eight to 12. Mm -hmm. But that all out set, like, is everything you got. Gotcha. 
So what are your thoughts on, on training to failure? Do you, do you do it often? It has its place. It has its time and place. Um, it really depends on the individual. It depends on, you know, how well you can recover, things like that. You know, if you're sleeping two hours a day and work, 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 you don't have time to eat, you're eating minimal calories, you know, training to failure is not going to be beneficial at all for you. But, I mean, it does have its time and place. I believe that you should be able to push yourself, that you should be close to failure each time you train. Yeah. I think that's one of the qualms that I have with over-application of the RPE mm -hmm. concept, is that people, it, it's not it's not a problem with the, with the RPE concept itself, but rather people's misapplication of it, in that people are just really bad at determining how close they are to failure in my experience mm -hmm. and, and I'll see a lot of people calling a, an RP9 set what realistically is like an RP6 or 7 set yeah. like they've got 4 or 5 reps left in the tank and, and they're just not really reaching uh, close enough to that failure point I think to, to spark some growth they're at, least, they're at least leaving some growth on the table in, in, in my opinion right and I, I like to say that there's two different types of failure there's a failure in which you can no longer do a rep on your own if you're training alone like you and then there's the oh you have someone there pushing you they might not be helping you but just like the extra push from them being there you know sometimes you can hit two or three extra reps so yeah that's a that's a really really good point and mm -hmm. and like they didn't help you so you're not pushing past failure but you're still hitting a failure point yeah if i know that i have a spotter on the bench press like just as an example i went in and hit 335 for a set of four um, a couple days ago and I had a, a good competent spotter on hand um, and if it weren't for him I probably wouldn't have been comfortable doing more than a single right uh, so that is really important and, and I do think that there's sort of an umbrella of, of safety concerns around that whole conversation um, because if, if you do tend to, to point push yourself too close to the failure point, then you do run the risk, obviously, uh, of injuring yourself acutely and then also, um, you know, having fatigue accumulate in, in a way that you don't want. Mm -hmm. So there, there are concerns on both sides of, of that. And then you have it in a more powerlifting style perspective mm -hmm. in which, you know, if you say you have a, for people who do lift a lot, a lot of weight, say you do a day or you have 700 pounds on the bar, you do it for some singles. You know, you're f that's going to be very, very taxing on your body. Mm -hmm. um, four days later, if you go in the gym and try to squat again, I mean, odds are, you well, most likely you're not going to be at peak performance there. So failure is going to be a lot different and a lot lower load used. Yeah, exactly. And because you're still not fully recovered from that. Yeah, I, I very, very rarely will go to... Does that, did that make sense? Yeah, oh, no, of course. Okay, cool. Yeah, of course. Cool. I'm just I, making, I, trying to sure I, uh, making sure I uh, kind of said that right. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I, I very rarely go to failure on the power list, actually. It's, mm -hmm. it's usually I save that for the, for the platform or for a max testing or something. Right. Yeah. Uh, so how about we move on to the nutrition stuff, Josh? I eat gummy bears. What's there more to say? <laughs> <laughs> gummy bears? Okay. Um, so, uh, are you a IAFYM guy? Do you do clean eating? What's the what's your take on that? I'm both. Um, I do track my macros. I try to keep the majority of my food whole foods. But, you know, if my girlfriend and I are going to go eat IHOP at 12 at night, we're, I'm going to go eat IHOP at 12 at night. If the craving hits and I'm not training for a show, it's going to happen. But I'm not so restricted to where, like in my off season, it's like I won't even compete for like another year in bodybuilding. So it's like if I'm going to eat these cookies, I'm going to have them. I don't care right now. But I'm just not going to let myself get carried away and get sloppy with it either. Right. So what are your thoughts on tracking macros in the off season? Do you do it? Um, I actually just started back. I've been kind of ballparking it, and I realized my ballpark was – in a different ballpark <laughs> so <laughs> um, I definitely was not eating nearly enough protein but right now um, I'm tracking again so I, I'm eating 280 grams of protein my carbs are at 500 grams and my fats are at 80 okay so those are some pretty reasonable numbers for a guy mm -hmm. your size in his off season 
you said that you were you were ballparking wrong. Does that mean you were you were under eating or over eating or under eating? Under eating protein. I was and under calories. eating protein and over eating carbs and fats. Right. So total calories were probably higher than you'd like them to be, but protein was lower. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm kind of in the same boat, Josh. Like I, as you probably know, just finished up my competitive season about a, a month ago, or, or maybe a little bit more than that now, and so. I've been kind of tracking um, intermittently, I guess, uh, but generally for the most part kind of just eating intuitively. And I try to set the constraint on myself that I will get some bolus of protein, say 25 to 40 grams every three hours or so, whether that's a shake or whatever. Um, and I found that that's a pretty good way to keep my protein up, but I do find that if I get a little bit busy, uh, I can fall behind, and then you know my day is over, and I'm still only at like a hundred grams of protein or something. Yeah. And so obviously that's not good. And uh, so yeah, I think that if there is a case to be made for tracking in the off season, it's to ensure that your protein is adequate and mm -hmm. your calories are at least somewhat consistently where you want them to be. Um, I think the problem comes when people just spend their entire lives in, in my fitness pal and they're trying to measure and weigh out everything that they eat. I'm not sure if that's unhealthy, but it, it certainly doesn't reflect typical human eating behaviors. So. Exactly. I mean, and like the IFYM crowd, they always claim, oh, like if you like broccoli, you have an eating disorder, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, some people, number one, like to eat like that just because you enjoy plain chicken does not mean you have an eating disorder. I can't stand when people always say that. Yeah. And then you have the people who can't eat anything if the my fitness pal does not have it in there. Yeah. It's like the whole point of flexible dieting is to be flexible. Mm -hmm. If you can't go out and enjoy yourself, where's the flexibility in that? Mm -hmm. Just because your app doesn't have a food in there. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I completely agree. <laughs> um, I think that there is a balance to be struck between having the structure that a stereotypical clean eater uh, would have and then having the flexibility that, you know, a idealized flexible dieter would have or probably just like a normal healthy human would have in that, you know, if, if you don't have the macros available on your app, then you can either just estimate them uh, to the best of your ability or just eat it and see what happens. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like one bad meal is not going to ruin everything. Especially, I mean, if I was contest prepping and I was close to a show, you know, I'm not going to go out and eat. There's like a greater picture there. Yes, exactly. Like what I'm working for. But if you're not training for anything like that where you have to be super low body fat on a stage and barely anything, it's like I guarantee you going out and having a hamburger that wasn't tracked is not going to kill you. And then I, I also say, like, as long as it, if it's, say, a hamburger, just to run with that, a hamburger in and of itself isn't going to be problematic. It's when it turns into a, a full night of hamburger and then fries and then you come home and you eat the tub of ice cream and then you get exactly. into the cereal and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's when it can kind of throw you off a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you just want the hamburger and the macros aren't available, then you can just have the hamburger. And it, like you said... Uh, that's that's not going to throw you off in the, in the grand scheme of things at all. Exactly. And it's like, well, oh, I don't need a cheat meal. I know I track everything in my macros. Well, it's like, you know, I see nothing wrong with having a cheat meal. You know, I call them free meals, and it's more of like a reward because I don't really consider cheating on my diet. But, you know, you don't always need to be tracking every single thing you eat all the freaking time. Yeah. Like you said, it's not normal eating behavior to do that. Um, and then I think in contest prep, it just becomes an inevitability that if you want mm -hmm. to get it to a certain level of leanness, then that's yes, at, one of at the that points. point. But that's different. Yeah, that's not just general living. Yeah, exactly. You're uh, starving yourself on purpose. Yeah. So, so speaking of that phase, um, I, I think I remember you telling me at the Olympia that you switched to a meal plan so many mm -hmm. weeks out from the show. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, I switched to a meal plan just because it's easier to follow. Um, it involves less thinking. You get diet brain. You don't want to have to think as hard. And I just, I don't mind it. I mean, I'm sane enough. I'm not going to have not been, well, I did eat quite a bit after, but I didn't care to gain a little bit of fat back. I wanted to. 
I don't really like being super lean all the time. But, yeah, um, I just prefer a meal plan. I do not mind it at all. just makes it easier. I don't have to think too hard about what i got to buy or what, where, where will this fit, where will this fit. It's like, oh, this is what I eat here, here, and here. It's okay. Yeah, exactly. I, I did a video on this on my YouTube channel, um, and I... I did the same thing, Josh. Actually, you probably inspired me to do it. <laughs> uh, after chatting with you at the Olympia was when I uh, switched to a meal plan, and I just ate the same meals uh, every day. And if my macros changed, I would just switch out the food portions so that they, they matched the macros that uh, Eric was giving me. Um, and, and I agree, it, it took a whole lot of mental pressure off of me in that I knew exactly what I was getting each meal. And, and then it also ensured that my, my pre-workout nutrition and my post-workout nutrition was on point and, mm -hmm. and at the very least consistent from day to day. So I, I found that to be a great benefit. And I also believe that consistency on prep is going to be a pretty key factor. Like if you're always doing the same thing and things aren't changing, you know exactly what you're doing. You have very, very or you're at a very good point to fine-tune things exactly how you want them to be because you've been so consistent with it. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point, too. So uh, let's talk about your cutting, your typical cutting macros. So you said you compete at around 175 pounds. Yes. Um, so take us through, let's say, the last month or so of your, your prep. How does that typically look for you? And then briefly touch on your, your strategy for peak week. There were no gummy bears. I was so sad. <laughs> I was so sad. <laughs> but um, in seriousness, um, my protein, I do, or Matt had me on pretty high protein. So that stayed up around like, I, was, I think it was like 300 grams while dieting. Right. Um, my carbs, when I calculated them, there was points where we got them. There were certain days where they got really low, like I think it was like 70 or 80 grams a day. And my fats were at like 30. But um, I generally stay, or I can lose good weight closer to the end, like the last four weeks. My protein was like at 300 carbs, or at like 130, 140. My fats were like 40. So did you start to reverse into the show? Um, no. Um, I had to continue to drop them. You had what? Oh, continue. Had, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had to continue to drop them as I led up to the show. And so then, did you feel like uh, you were flat as a result of that, or did you did you find like peak week was enough to sort of fill you out? Um, peak week definitely did fill me out how we wanted it to, but like about 10 days out, I remember doing my progress pictures, and I remember like literally coming to tears in my eyes looking at them because I thought I looked so horrible. I was so flat and stringy, like nothing, like I couldn't even like flex my back because nothing was popping. I remember like, I lost everything, all my muscle, it's gone. I remember just like freaking out. And then on stage, you know, it's completely, completely different look. Yeah. So I was pleased with how we peaked. Um, I did two shows this past year. The first one, you know, we actually kept it we increased my food gradually up until like the from the last week gradually increased it that week but the second show because I actually missed middleweights at the first one I, could, I weighed in heavy so I had to be a light heavyweight mm. but at, when I did North Americans we had to come down to middleweight so we had to drop cows and pretty pretty low to make weight for that to ensure so when we peaked for that um, actually we had a, I think it was two days of eating, we, I know the day, the day before, from like 5 a.m. to 10 p.m., every two hours, I ate like 80 grams of carbs and like 30 grams of protein, and minimal fat, whatever like was in the beef or whatever I was cooking was like the fat. Every two hours, I ate that. About 10 o'clock at night, I was still super flat, super stringy, had to go out eat like a hamburger, french fries, all that good stuff, a lot of sodium. Got back to the hotel, still kind of flat, had to eat like another huge meal, wake up in the morning. I, we just had to keep feeding me. Like at that point, like the food was not sticking to me at all. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. But we ended, we ended up filling out nicely though for it in the, in the end, so I was happy. Right. Um, 
I'm wondering if you'd mind sharing uh, if you did anything with your water because it sounds to me like maybe if you if you drank a little bit more you might have filled out more if you weren't already. Um, we still had, yeah. After I mean before weigh-ins, you know, we did cut the water back slightly, but we were still drinking. Like we drink. I can't remember exactly, but you know, like a few liters the morning of and stuff. Like we had good amount of good amount of water still coming in. Right. Like we never completely cut it out. Right, right, okay. Yeah. No, I, I hear those stories of guys who just like you said, it's like the food just isn't sticking and mm -hmm. you just <laughs> are eating like crazy and, and seem to, to not be filling out. I remember like I would get on the scale and like after I would eat like just ate like and I'd be like a little bit lighter. I'm like, how is that possible? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would love to be able to to trace what it is that's that's happening, like actually measure um, like the, where those carbs are are going, how they're being partitioned. Because um, mm -hmm. I've been looking at some research on this, and uh, I think one study cited that after I think like in in a glycogen depleted state, uh, I think that they cited uh, we have the capacity to store 15 grams. Uh, of glycogen per kilogram of body weight. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm about, you know, 75 kilos. That's just over a thousand grams of, of carbs as a, as a potential store. So that's quite a lot. Um, and then I read another study that, that cited that after 400 grams of, of carbs, or it might have been 500, I forget now, um, we start oxidizing those carbs at just a drastically increased rate, so just kind of burning them off. Um, and then also, it, it, there is a significant increase in de novo lipogenesis. Um, but in, in the case of a bodybuilder, you know, who's been dieting on 70 grams of carbs and 30 grams of fat, I'd be really curious to know what's happening with, with all that food that you're taking in. Exactly. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's, that's really cool, Josh. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, no problem. As for, uh, let's, let's just flip back to the off-season really quick, and then we'll jump into the rapid-fire questions here. Okay. I um, want to point out I did not reverse diet this year to people. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Like, I know, like, that's a big thing. People, oh, I do a slow reverse diet. I think you even have a video on reverse dieting where you don't necessarily agree with it. Correct, Jeff? Yeah. I, I think that, like most things, it should be uh, fitted to the individual. I, mm -hmm. think that some pe I think that reverse dieting is more of a psychological approach than a physiological approach. Exactly. One. Um, so I think that for some people it works really well with their personality types and, and for others it, it would just be a disaster. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't been uh, reverse dieting in my last, I think, th three shows or so. Okay. Um, and, and I found that just eating intuitively, getting back to my uh, stable off-season set point weight uh, as, as quickly as I want to and then just sitting there uh, is, is a better approach for me. Um, mm -hmm. I think that what a lot of people struggle with is the <laughs> and then just sitting there part. Uh, they tend to just keep eating and eating and eating and, and push themselves above and beyond their set point. Uh, but for me, even though I don't find it that difficult to exceed my set point because my appetite just goes all the way down, um, even if it didn't, and, and it sometimes it, it, it isn't, uh, I just think, well, you know, if I had the discipline to go through my prep and stick to my macros when I was, you know, under 8% body fat or whatever and, and, and really struggling, then, you know, I just ate <laughs> X number of pizzas and everything. Like, I can have the discipline to not overeat one night and, and make sure that my weight, you know, gets, gets comfortable and, and sticks around here. So that's right. an approach that I've taken and been successful with. And also, like, the point of reverse dieting is really to get your body back to normal, get your hormones and everything back to how they were. So why would you stay in a deficit for an extended period of time? Yeah, exactly. That's, I, that's I, the I, point I, that, that I make in my video. Yeah, I don't understand that. Why would you want to continue to be in a deficit if you're trying to normalize yourself? Yeah, I've been trying to figure that one out, and I've asked quite a lot of people about it. And, and it seems to me that the the I guess the most charitable answer would be uh, that it's important to that person to, to stay within, you know, distance of their contest weight. I see this a lot in women, uh, bikini competitors, mm -hmm. say, who don't have to get ultra, ultra lean and want to retain some resemblance of their stage shape for as long as they can, which I think is a reasonable goal. And so as, as long as, you know, they're not suffering too much or it's something that they genuinely want, then... In, in that case, I, I wouldn't see a problem with a, a really slow reverse diet, I guess. Um, 
but the reality is that if you, if you are going to go with that approach, you have to accept the impeded recovery, likely you know variable moods, um, and, and uh, I guess probably to some degree um, impeded progress as well. Uh, because I, I try to emphasize that most people should gain some weight after their contest if they want to, you know, improve their overall look as much as they can by adding muscle after the show. Right. Um, so I think there, I think like we, I think we're on exactly the same page. I think that there's a there's a balance to be struck there, and it's really going to depend on that individual, their personality, their goals, and, and so on. So. Uh, Josh, let's jump into uh, the. I've got some rapid fire questions here for you. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe you can give a quick answer and I'll give a quick answer and we'll move on. So, uh, question one What is something that people think is bro but actually isn't? Um, I think we've talked about two of those things training body part once per week and following a meal plan. Training a body? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That, those are good. I, I, I yeah. think I would probably have to say those are the two things that are always pinned as bro. Like, mm -hmm. if you follow a bro split, you're never going to make progress. Blatantly not true. Like, we have decades of bodybuilders who have made great progress on And everybody on who does work out, when they all started, they were training one. They made the most gains when they were training once per week. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say I, I think that the research is pretty clear. It's not mm -hmm. as conclusive as people think. I think, uh, but it is pretty clear that I think, you know, higher training frequencies, generally speaking, are better for progress. Um, oh, and but, I but, do agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in your case, I think you have a good example here because it's, you know, it's someone who already has massive legs. Uh, your legs probably take a long time to recover given the amount of volume you'd have to put them through in order to, to actually stimulate them optimally. Uh, so it would make sense that you would, you know, need a week of recovery in between sessions. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what food do you crave the most when prepping? Pizza. <laughs> pizza. I love pizza's the one food. Um, pizza and hamburgers, I would say. <laughs> pizza and hamburgers are the one thing I crave as much when I'm prepping as when I'm not prepping. Like right now, it's like I just ate not long ago, but if my girlfriend were to say, hey, let's go get some pizza, I'd be like, on it. Ordered. Done. Or like, hey, let's go get a hamburger. It's like, done. I don't care. Yeah. And then when prepping, it's like, I see like Domino's commercials. I'm like, oh, I want, I want pizza. <laughs> it's like, I want it so badly. I, I remember, I um, it was like two weeks out. Um, I was at work one Sunday and like a commercial for Domino's came on. I ended up going on their website and like acting if I was going to place an order like, ooh, this is what I would eat right now. Oh, I would get this and this and this. I'm like, oh, I can't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done the same sort of stuff. I'm like, I love pizza. Yeah. For me, it's more of the sweet stuff. I find I don't start craving the fatty stuff until a bit after. Like, I, I just really want sweet stuff. So, like, cheesecake and ice cream, froyo, okay. cookies. Yeah, I, I guess everybody's different, but I, w I definitely wouldn't turn down a slice of pizza if you put it in front of me. <laughs> I'm a sweets person. Um, if, you know, you've probably seen my posts. I love candy and stuff like that. But whenever I get really lean... I crave more fatty type foods rather than sweets. Like if you told me, oh, don't eat sweets anymore, it's like, okay, no worries. Oh. But like the fattier foods are what I crave the most. That's interesting. I guess that there's probably uh, an individual component uh, to that. I, I guess I, I kind of crave everything. Like I would eat an extra serving of oatmeal and be ecstatic yeah. over it when I'm prepping. <laughs> yeah, it's like there was a time, like I had my oatmeal increase, like one serving. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing <laughs> yeah. ever. I was well, like, yes. For whatever reason on prep, I just crave oats like crazy. Like it's huh. all I want to eat. Um, but it's weird in the off season, I, I probably wouldn't even be able to choke it down to be honest. Yeah, I don't like oatmeal when I'm not dieting. It's hard to eat. Yeah, I agree. Uh, like you said, like waking up throughout the night, I would do that. Like the mornings, I know I would have almond butter with my oatmeal. It was like I would go to sleep so excited. It's like, it's like, oh, praise God, I'm getting almond butter tomorrow. It's like I'm yeah. so excited. I would wake up like at 4, and I usually wake up at 6. And I'm like, if I do my cardio now, I could go ahead and have it. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I could go ahead and eat it right now. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I was like, why wait two more hours? Yeah. I mean, the good thing about prep is it does get you into a good rhythm of, of, of waking up at a reasonable time and going to bed at a reasonable time. Because you just want to go to bed so you can get up and eat. 
literally, that's like the one thing on your mind is if I go to sleep now, I can wake up and eat. I'm so happy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I've heard, I think I saw on a meme somewhere or something, it's like sleeping is just a time machine to breakfast. <laughs> that's so true. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Ice Cream for PRs podcast. Um, thank you, Josh, very much for, for coming on the show and sharing all of your uh, wonderful insight with us. Yeah, no problem, man. It's been a pleasure. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get to see you at the, at the Arnold Classic, and maybe we'll get a lift in or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Awesome, man. All right. All right. Thank you guys cool. very much once again for listening, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.